want us to turn now to the chapter that we read together in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And uh, really what I want to do today is to highlight the first five words of the chapter that we read together in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 1. We read from the beginning. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I want to underline these first five words in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I suppose that uh, if you know your Bibles at all, you know that the book of Revelation is not the easiest of books to understand. One of the great statements in our Westminster Confession of Faith tells us that the Bible is clear or perspicuous is what the theologians say. It's easy to understand, easy to read, the words are familiar to us. And yet a book like Revelation can cause no end of problems. There are a whole lot of problems connected, first of all, with the purpose for which the book of Revelation was written. Some people think that it was a commentary on events that were taking place at the time of the New Testament church. Other people say that it is a book all about events that are still to take place. Other commentators have uh, taken a kind of middle uh, of the road view and said there are some things that were true of the New Testament church at the time of writing, other things that are still in the future. And then there are individual passages in the book of Revelation that cause a whole lot of problems. Passages like Revelation 20 and uh, its teaching about the millennium and the thousand year period. And it's difficult to know when exactly uh, that thousand year period is going to be and whether it's going to be literal and so on. Now I'm just uh, highlighting what you know already that of all the parts of scripture, the book of Revelation seems to be shrouded in mystery. So many thick clouds around the concepts and around the teachings of this uh, great closing book of the Bible. And yet the strange thing is that this book is a revelation. And at the very beginning of this book, that is exactly the word that is used. It may be mysterious, there may be many parts of it and many passages and verses that are difficult to understand, but this book is here not in order to perplex us and in order to leave us uh, wondering and uh, questioning, this book is here to reveal things to us. That is what our revelation does. It reveals things. We're having a, a marriage in our congregation in Sky, all being well next Friday. And uh, the people that were getting married came to the church last uh, Thursday evening and we had a kind of rehearsal of the wedding. It's always a kind of false thing, but you know, you have to, do, do, you have to go through just so that everybody knows where they're meant to be standing and where they're meant to go and how they're meant to come into the church when the actual wedding takes place. And one of the most uh, problematic parts of the wedding is for the chief bridesmaid to know when to lift the bride's veil. It's got to be lifted sometime so that the bridegroom can be sure that he's married the right person. But there are so many parts to the service and the, the, the chief bridesmaid usually gets so worried and so concerned that she'll uh, lift the veil at the wrong moment or that uh, the minister will give her a dirty look and say that uh, she's doing it all wrong. And so I, I, I've got to point it out very clearly at the end of the second prayer, at the end of the second prayer, that's when you lift the veil. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that that's precisely the concept 
that this word revelation is bringing to us because in the Greek language the word for revelation means the lifting of a veil. Without it some things remain hidden and obscure. Without the lifting of the veil some things remain mysterious, shrouded in darkness and we can't see them and can't understand them. And what this verse is telling us and what this book is telling us is that in the Bible there is a face that we must look at. And here we are reminded that God has lifted the veil from that face for us so that we can see it with a clarity, we can see it clearly and unambiguously and underneath that veil, John tells us that we see the face of Jesus. What we have here in this last book of the Bible is what we have in the whole of the Bible and in the message of the gospel. We have an unveiling of Jesus Christ. We've got a revelation of the glory of Jesus. What otherwise would remain hidden and obscure and away from our line of vision has now been made clear and revealed for us. And what John tells us about this is that this revelation was first of all given by God the Father to Jesus himself. Now we know from the epistle to the Hebrews that that was the case. We know that the reason that Jesus endured the sufferings of the cross when he went to Calvary was because of what God had revealed to him. The epistle of the Hebrews puts it like this. Because of the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross and despised its shame. God made a revelation to Jesus. God unveiled for Jesus the glory that lay on the other side of Calvary. God showed to him the glory of his resurrection, the glory of his ascension, the glory of his headship over the church, the glory of his final ultimate triumph. And because God showed these things to Jesus, Jesus endured everything that the cross had to give him by way of suffering and shame. But here John tells us that the glorious thing is this, that that revelation that God gave to Jesus was to be passed on to the servants of Jesus so that they too would see his glory, so that they too would have a glimpse of his majesty, so that they too would see the face, and so that in seeing the face they would be encouraged to go on in their Christian lives and in their Christian witness. Now let's remind ourselves of what John was doing when he had this revelation passed on to him. He wasn't sitting in his study reading these books that he had collected over the years. He wasn't sitting in a theological library somewhere surrounded by all the best commentaries and all the best literature. He wasn't in a fellowship, in a conference, in a congregation. He was exiled and banished in loneliness to the island of Patmos. And it was a very difficult trial for him to bear, to be separated from people and from places that he had come to know and come to love. And what does God do for him on the island of Patmos? When he's there surrounded by the veil of his loneliness and of his suffering and the pain of his banishment in his old age. God lifts the veil and God gives to him a revelation of Jesus Christ. God allows John to see some of the things that he himself had shown to Jesus that would lie on the other side of Calvary. God allows John to see something of the majesty and the brilliance and the splendor of the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne. And the purposes of God's salvation worked out in Jesus Christ until at last Jesus will come again and will judge the world and be glorified in his church. 
God gave to John on the island of Patmos a revelation of Jesus, an unveiling of the Saviour. And I'm just suggesting today that in every life represented here, in every congregation and home, that's exactly what you need and what I need from day to day. We need an unveiling. We need a lifting of the veil. We need a, a pulling aside of the curtain so that as we go on, we'll see Jesus. Because if we don't see Jesus, we won't have any encouragement to run the race with patience. That's the picture that the Bible uses of the Christian life. Many pictures in the Bible. One of them is somebody who's running a race, pouring all his energy into running. Seems a daft thing to do, but you see, this guy has got his eye on the goal. He's looking at something. There's a point dead ahead and he's aiming for it and because his eyes are fixed on that point his energy is consumed with his running that race so it must be with you and with me if we are Christians today we must run the race with patience looking to Jesus and there are many things that are going to obscure Jesus from our vision there are many curtains, many veils that are going to block him from our view. Many clouds that are going to flit across our sky. Our own difficulties, our own tragedies, our own problems, our own pain, our own ignorance, our own lack of understanding, our own lack of fellowship. All of these clouds will flit across our sky and they will block out the light of the sunshine. We need an unveiling of Jesus. We need a revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to see the face that is beyond the veil in order to encourage us from day to day. Let me just suggest one or two things. Let me say first of all that we need to see Jesus unveiled in all his splendor at the right hand of God. Sometimes it's very easy to be discouraged in the Christian life. It's very easy to think when the world around us is going one way and we're trying to battle against the stream, sometimes it's very easy to think that really perhaps we're on the losing side after all. There's the world with its cares and with its pleasures and with its pastimes and no thought of God. It's pushed God out of its agenda and out of its view altogether and yet it's getting on so well. That's what David saw in Psalm 73. There he was, he had been following God for so long since his earliest days and yet now he's seeing wicked men who swear and blaspheme and they're getting on so well. God isn't doing anything about it. And he's perhaps thinking, well, perhaps, perhaps I'm just following God to no effect. Perhaps it's all in vain that I'm a Christian. Well, you know what he had to do? He had to go into the house of God and he had to get things into that proper perspective. He had to realize that this world, with all that it has, is on a slippery slope to hell. And it's only when he realizes that, that he can understand that only people who have God have hope and encouragement from day to day. And that's what makes him so firm in his resolve after that, to go on with God, and not only that, but to try and rescue that world around him, to say to people, it's good to follow God. In order to do that, we've got to have an unveiling of Jesus. We've got to remind ourselves of the splendor and the majesty that belong to him. We've got to realize and remind ourselves today that our faith is built on the fact of his victory over death and over sin. The Apostle Paul put it like this. <clears throat> I, he says, have gone and I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. What good will that be if Jesus has not risen. If Jesus is not risen, he says, our preaching is in vain. We're wasting our time. We're still in our sins. 
The reason we are preaching, the reason we're absorbed in the Christian work and ministry and service is because of the victory and the glory and the splendor that belong to the Savior. The devil tried to stop Jesus time and time again. Jesus was born a little baby into the world. Satan said to Herod, you try and kill him. So he sent out a decree that all the little baby boys would be put to death. It didn't work. Jesus escaped Satan's plan. When, Satan, when Jesus was a man, he was led into the wilderness. Satan said, I missed you when you were a child. I'm going to get you now. And there in the wilderness, he tempted Jesus with every kind of bribe and temptation that he thought was possible to ensnare and trap the Son of God and keep him from going to the cross to fight his battle and win his war. Jesus stood his ground. The devil was defeated. He had to slink away with his tail between his legs and Jesus had the victory. And then three years later, you know, Judas Iscariot had been following Jesus. He was one of his disciples. Satan entered into the heart of Judas and Satan said, Jesus, I missed you when you were a little boy. I missed you when you were a man starting your ministry, but I'm going to get you now. And he enters into the heart of Judas and Judas betrays his master with a kiss and Jesus is crucified and there's a party in hell because they've got him now. And Satan is dancing. He's saying to himself as he sees Jesus on that cross, I missed you before, but I've got you now. But Satan has forgotten the plan and the purpose of God from the very dawn of human history. Oh, he says in the Garden of Eden, the Savior will come. And he'll be bruised. But he's going to deliver a death blow to the devil and to his kingdom. And Satan's forgotten that. And as he's dancing and partying because he's got the Savior, suddenly the bands of death are broken and Jesus ascends up on high and he brings captivity captive as his own prisoner. And he's defeated the devil who has the power of death. And he's freed his own people. And he's now at the right hand of God with the keys of hell and of death in his hands. Satan had said, I've got you now. But Satan was wrong. Jesus has risen with victory and power over sin and over death and over the grave. I tell you, my friend, it is the most reassuring and comforting thing to remind yourself time and time and time again that your Christian faith is built upon a fact, a fact of resurrection, a fact of triumph, a fact of victory. We need to remind ourselves of Jesus in splendor at the right hand of God. We need time and time again to have the veil lifted to look at the face of the victor, the conqueror. You remember the last great words of Julian the Apostate, that great emperor who had spent so much time and energy in persecuting the Christian church and on his deathbed had to say, Thou hast triumphed, O Galilean. That is where you and I must take our encouragement from, as John did here at the very beginning of his pilgrimage into this great revelation, these great mysteries that God was going to show to him throughout this book. Fear not, I am he that liveth and was dead. We need an unveiling of Jesus in all of his splendor. But then I'm going to say this too. We need an unveiling of Jesus for all of our sins. Because, you know, Jesus and sinners have very little in common. Jesus is absorbed with the glory of God. Sinners are absorbed with their own glory and their own self-interest. 
Jesus is consumed with a passion for God's house and cause and kingdom. Sinners are consumed with a passion for themselves. Jesus is consumed with a desire to do the will of God. Sinners, because they are sinners, are sinners because they disobey the will of God. Rabbi Duncan, who was the great professor of Old Testament in New College in Edinburgh, said this on one occasion. Jesus came to save the very opposites of himself. And it's absolutely true. He came to save the very opposites of himself. There he is, pure and infinitely holy, and he has come for impure and unholy sinners. And I'm telling you today, you know, sinners of that kind need an unveiling of Jesus. Because the glory of the gospel is that it is this Jesus that calls these sinners to himself. Although Rabbi Duncan said oh, what I've just said, he said, that's not all he said. What he actually said was this. Jesus came to save the very opposites of himself, but not so as to leave them such. Not so as to leave them the very opposites of himself. He came for sinners that were as unlike himself as you could possibly imagine, but not so that he would leave them in the same condition as he found them. He came to call sinners. He came to invite sinners. He came to offer to sinners the hope of everlasting life. He came with an invitation that has the name of sinners written on it. He came to say, whosoever will, let him come. He came to say to men and women of every kind, in every condition, there is good news here for you. We need a revelation of Jesus. There are some people who say to us that we can get straight to heaven. We can't get straight to heaven. There is no straight road from where a sinner is to the gates of heaven. There is a straight road from where a sinner is to the doors of hell. You don't need to get off the road you're on in order to reach hell. It's a straight road that takes an ungodly man or woman or boy or girl to final and eternal punishment. There is no straight road to heaven. But you know, the good news of the gospel is this today, that there is a straight road to Jesus Christ. That's why we need him to be unveiled and revealed to us. We can't go straight to heaven the way we are, but we can go straight to him. That is why we've got a gospel that is unconditional. That means you don't need to do anything in order to believe, but believe. You all know the story of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. The dream that John Bunyan had about a man who was concerned about his sins and the burden of his sins. And how eventually he found release and redemption at the cross. C.H. Spurgeon, in one of his sermons tells a very, very uh, lovely story. The story goes something like this. It's about a young man in the city of Edinburgh, long ago, who decided to be a missionary. And he said to himself, well now, I'm going to be a missionary for Jesus. And the best place for me to be a missionary isn't on the other side of the world, but right here in Edinburgh. I'll be a missionary right here. Spurgeon says this young man went out onto the streets of Edinburgh and the first person that he saw was uh, a woman with a creel full of herring and fish on her back. So he said, I'm going to go and be a missionary to this woman. And he went up to her and he said, Lady, is that a burden on your back? And she said, yes, it is. And he said, Lady, do you have another burden? And she looked at him and she said, do you mean the burden that Bunyan talks about in Pilgrim's Progress? Well, of course, that took the wind right out of his sails because that's exactly what he was going to say to her. 
And he said, yes, that's the burden I mean. Well then, young man, she said, don't you tell me to do with my burden what Bunyan's evangelist told Christian to do with his burden. Well, the man was flabbergasted. He had to revise his pilgrim's progress and he had to think, what did the minister, the evangelist, say to Christian in the pilgrim's progress? Well, those of you who know it will remember what he said. When uh, uh, Christian came out of the city of destruction with his burden on the back, evangelist said to him, do you see yonder wicked gate? He pointed him to a gate and he said that on the other side of the gate there was a light. And if he followed that light, it would take him to the cross. And so it did. This woman turned to the missionary in Edinburgh and said, Young man, the evangelist should have told him to go straight to the cross. You see the point that she was making? It's very easy for us sometimes to describe to people the steps to take in order to become a Christian. We've got to tell them to go straight to the cross. To go straight to Jesus. That the way is opened. There are no conditions in the road. There are no steps to glory. Martin Luther thought that well. He thought that if he climbed up enough steps on his knees in the city of Rome, he would get to heaven. He would please God that way. Until he discovered that the way to God was open. Because the way to Jesus was open. We need an unveiling of Jesus in all of his splendor for all of our sins. And the great message from that highest place and court of authority that there is from that throne room of glory is that the Savior says to sinners to come exactly the way they are. To you to come the way you are. To me to come the way I am without any conditions, without having done any other thing first. It's sinners that he entertains. He came for the very opposites of himself, but not to leave them that way, to call them into his banqueting house, to let them feast on the provision of his salvation. We need to come to him with our sins. Let me just say one other thing. We need an unveiling of Jesus in all of our circumstances in life. A vision of his splendor for all of our sins in all of our circumstances. Because sometimes circumstances can get us down. Sometimes circumstances are our greatest enemies. Sometimes God's providence in our experience is the most difficult thing to bear. Sometimes it's not easy to face the problems of life and the difficulties of life and the circumstances of life. John knew all about that banished as he was to the island of Patmos. That's why God gave him an unveiling of Jesus because God is saying to him, John, you must learn to lift your eyes away from your circumstances and up to Jesus. This might be an island. You might be lonely. You might have been banished here. But I'm telling you this, if you lift up your eyes to Jesus... This Patmos will become a paradise to you. Lift your eyes away from your circumstances and fix them on Jesus. If we do that, then everything will fall into its proper perspective and place. Sometimes, sometimes on the horizon we can see the burdens and the problems getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We can see the storm coming. We can see it brewing. And we're filled with awe and dread at what's happening to us. And in the pain of our lives, situation sometimes, we can lose sight of Jesus. The veil can come down. Our very providence can be like a curtain that shuts him from our view. We need an unveiling. 
we need a revelation. We need to lift our eyes away from the immediate circumstances in which we are and on to Jesus. And if our eyes are on Jesus, we can face our circumstances, not in our strength, but in his. My affliction, says Paul, is light compared with that eternal weight of glory. He knew what it meant to lift his eyes away from the tyranny of his circumstances and fix them on Jesus. When he comes at last to the point of dying, he's leaving Timothy to go out with the gospel and he's got this terrible prospect in front of him. He's got to face this last enemy. He's got to die. He's never died before. His body and soul have never been separated before. He's preached about dying. He's preached about judgment. He's preached about the afterlife. He's preached about eternity. But now he's got to face it himself. And from his prison cell, writing to Timothy, now he's got to step into the river of death himself. He spent his whole ministry telling other people about how to die. Now he's got to die himself. How does he do it? He does it by lifting his arms. of his soul in life, in death, throughout eternity, to Jesus Christ. And now, on his deathbed, he's got a new revelation, an unveiling of the face that's waiting for him on the other side. Stephen was the same. When men stood there, Saul of Tarsus among them, listening to him, hating him, taking these big boulders and throwing them on his body till the life was beaten out of him. Stephen, even in these last moments, knew what it was to lift his eyes away from these circumstances and fix them on Jesus and see Jesus standing at the right hand. And you know, the glorious thing is this, that one day all of this will be passed. And in the glory of heaven, there will be no day. We will see him, John says, as he is. We will be like him, face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends, today what a great hope the child of God has. Because he has seen the glory of God in the face of the Savior. It sustains John throughout his banishment. And now he's with God's people perfected in paradise, looking on and worshipping the Lamb who's in the midst of the throne. And in this cold world in which we have to live and witness and minister for our Lord, it's the only encouragement that we can have to have an unveiling of Jesus with all his splendor in all our sins, in all our circumstances, to look away from ourselves to the face of Jesus. The bride eyes not her garment but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on my King of grace. Not at the crown he gave her, but on his pierced hand for glory, glory dweller in Emmanuel's land. May God grant today that the gospel through the power of the Spirit would lift the veil for us and that we would gaze on the face of the Savior. May God bless his word to us. Amen. We'll conclude our service today by singing the last three verses of Psalm 72. 
17 to 19 to God's praise. Psalm 72 at verse 17, his name forever shall endure, last like the sun it shall, men shall be blessed in him, and blessed all nations shall him call. At verse 17 to God's praise, his name forever shall endure. This name forever shall endure, last night, last night it shall, men shall be blessed in heaven, and all nations shall mercy and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us all, now and forever. Amen.